In the previous lesson, we learned about the Biot-Savart law and how we can use it to determine the magnetic field at any point in space due to all the current elements near that point. We found the magnetic field at the center of a current loop and the magnetic field at a point away from an infinitely long current carrying wire, which was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Who am I getting? It was a nightmare. If you thought to yourself, there's got to be a better way to do this, you're actually in luck. The subject of this video is Ampere's law, which is our ticket out of ever needing to perform that specific calculation ever again. We have many questions to answer though. For one, what is Ampere's law? Instead of deriving Ampere's law from the Biot-Savart law, which would also be approximately a nightmare at this stage, I'll just present Ampere's law in its final form and explain what everything means. How's that sound? This is Ampere's law, the integral over a closed loop in space of B dot DL around that loop is equal to mu naught times the current that penetrates through the closed loop. You might notice some similarities between this and Gauss's law from electrostatics. They are pretty similar looking and in fact we also implement them similarly in practice as we'll see later in this lesson. Let's go back to our really long current carrying wire again and touch on a few things. Then we'll try to use Ampere's law in an example. If you watched the previous lesson video, you might recall that the magnetic field at perpendicular distance r away from a long current carrying wire is given by mu naught i over 2 pi r in magnitude, and it points like this with respect to the wire. In the lesson we used the letter a instead of lowercase r. The reason we did was just to make sure we didn't confuse it with a little r vector from the Biot-Savart law. But here, since we already have the answer, we'll just work with r from now on. Now, that happens to be the magnetic field at one point in space, but what if we twist the wire? You'll notice the field spot has moved to stay consistent with the twist, but the wire itself is exactly the same, even after we twist it. If everything about the wire is the same, what's stopping us from saying the magnetic field at our original point in space is just given by that same original vector? I mean, isn't it? We could go through all the motions again with the bios of our law, but what's the point? Everything is the same. The current's the same, the wire position and orientation is the same, the perpendicular distance is the same, everything is the same. If we keep applying the same logic to multiple twists of the wire, we see that the magnetic field vectors trace out this... I don't really know what to call it, it's like a spiral, flowery kind of pattern? Well, drawing out all these field vectors is a pain in the butt. Why draw out these field vectors when we could just draw magnetic field lines instead? that are tangent to all the respective field vectors. Around a long current carrying wire, we have circular magnetic field lines that are perpendicular to the current direction and have magnitudes given by mu naught i over 2 pi r. But is any of this really surprising? You might remember from another lesson way back in the day, we were able to figure out the magnetic field direction of a bunch of charges moving together using a simpler, albeit incorrect version of the Biot-Savart law. So none of this should come as a shock, really, but how do we keep track of which way the magnetic field lines curl around the wire? Do they curl like this, or in the other direction? This is actually a convenient application of our modified right-hand rule. We point our extended thumb in the direction of the current, and the way our fingers curl is the way the magnetic field lines curl around the wire, almost as if we're grabbing the wire, you see? Now back to Ampere's law. Say, for example, we need the direction of the magnetic field lines around a long current carrying wire, but not the magnitude. In other words, let's completely scrap this result we got from the previous lesson. All we know is the direction. If all we knew was the direction of the field lines, but not the magnitude of the field itself, I propose that we can actually use Ampere's law to find the magnitude directly. That's actually one of the key situations where Ampere's law might be useful. It's useful when you know the direction of the magnetic field everywhere, but you don't know its magnitude. So let's take another look. The closed loop integral of B dot DL is equal to mu naught times the current that the loop encloses, or the current that passes through the loop. It'll actually be easier to think back to Gauss's law and apply a lot of the same problem solving tactics. One of the first things we'd do when we decided we wanted to make use of Gauss's law was to define some closed Gaussian surface. It could be any surface, but once we choose it, there's no going back. We evaluate the surface integral for that particular surface and set it equal to the charge enclosed inside the surface with the end goal of determining the electric field somewhere on the surface. 
When we use Ampere's law, we got a pretty similar deal. We now want to define a closed loop before starting, any loop you want. Then, once we've decided on our loop, we apply Ampere's law to determine the circulation of the magnetic field, or B dot DL, around this loop. Now the question is, how do we know what loop to choose? We ran into a similar issue with Gauss's law. How did we know which surface to choose? Well, let's just try thinking up a loop. What if we had a circular loop like this, sort of tilted at some angle with respect to the wire? Is this a good choice for a loop? I would say no, this is not a good choice for our closed loop. The reason why is because the magnetic field is changing so much throughout the loop. So how do we compute B dot DL for each DL? There's no obvious and easy way we can make progress. Remember, the goal of using Ampere's law is to never actually evaluate this integral using hard calculus. You want to be able to pull B out of the integral really easily. When we were dealing with Gauss's law, there were good choices for Gaussian surfaces and bad choices. And the bad choices usually involved surfaces for which the electric field was changing in magnitude a lot. But if we could find a surface where which E dot the dA vector was either constant or zero everywhere along that surface, it allowed us to avoid directly evaluating the integral, and we could just pull the E out. In the case of our loop, clearly B dot DL is not constant or zero along the loop, because depending on where you are on the loop, the direction of B with respect to DL is different. And not only that, the magnitude of B is different depending on where you are on the loop. So it's a double whammy no-go. Keep in mind that it's a no-go even though we could figure out the right-hand side of the equation. The current that the loop encloses is just the current of the single wire I. What about if we just take this circular loop and slice it through the wire like this? Is this good? Well, in this case, you might notice that no matter which DL we choose, B dot DL is going to be zero because they'll both be at right angles by the way the magnetic field curls around the wire. So the total integral on the left will just evaluate to zero since B dot DL is zero for all points along the loop. As for the current passing through the loop, it's also zero in this case. It's a little tricky to see here, but there's actually no current entering or exiting the loop because all the current is moving parallel to the plane of the loop. So our final equation is zero equals zero. Wow, who would have thought? That choice for a loop wasn't so helpful either, so I'll introduce another choice just to drive the point home. What if instead of a circular loop, we had a square loop like this, perpendicular to the wire? Again, we run into the same problems as the first two loops. Neither does B point in the same direction as DL along the loop, nor does B have a constant magnitude along the loop. Let's try another loop. What about this circular loop here that's perpendicular to the current carrying wire? Is this a good choice for a closed loop to evaluate our integral? Well, let's think about it. For every point along the loop, B points in the same direction as DL. B is parallel to DL. Also by symmetry, we know B has to have the same magnitude at all points around the loop. It goes back to that little symmetry trick we played in the beginning. If we twist the wire about its axis, it's exactly the same wire. So the magnetic field it creates at that point should be the same no matter how the wire is twisted. So if B is always parallel to DL for this specific loop, we can write the vector B dotted with the vector DL as equal to the magnitude of B times the magnitude of DL. Now before we keep going with the integral, what is the current enclosed by our ampere loop? It's really just the current of the wire itself, I. In this case, all of the wire current passes through the loop, so that current I is the current enclosed by the loop. And if B is constant in magnitude everywhere along the closed curve by symmetry, like it is here, then we can pull B out of the integral and we're left with B times the closed loop integral of DL is equal to mu naught times the current I. Now what is the closed loop integral of DL? It's just the integration or the sum of all the infinitesimal length elements that make up the loop. That sum is just the circumference of the loop or 2 pi r, where r is the radius of the loop. If we divide both sides by 2 pi r, we have our final answer for b. The magnitude of b at all points around this ampere loop that we defined is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi r. Of course, that's the same answer we got from using the bios of our law, but the process was much less nightmarish. Because even though we still had to deal with an integral, evaluating the integral was a piece of cake and didn't require any substantial knowledge of calculus. And that's our second key pointer for when Ampere's law is useful. Ampere's law is useful 
when you can find a loop for which evaluating the closed loop integral of b dot dl is easy peasy lemon squeezy. Evaluating the Ampere integral has to be easy. If you find yourself solving some complicated calculus problem like with the bios of Varla, you're almost certainly doing something wrong. With that out of the way, there are three common scenarios at the intro physics level for which using Ampere's law is pretty useful. The first scenario is, well, the one we just did, a long straight current carrying wire. We found the magnetic field outside the wire, but it's common to ask about the magnetic field inside the wire as well. And this is actually the associated exercise for this lesson. Given the wire has uniform current density, what's the magnetic field inside a current carrying wire? The magnetic field lines still curl around the inside of the wire like they do outside, and for a given radius, the magnitude of the magnetic field is the same by symmetry. It's one of the most common Ampere's Law type questions that I've seen asked at the intro physics level. The second common scenario where Ampere's Law is directly relevant is the magnetic field inside a solenoid, but we got a whole separate video for that one, so we'll put that on hold for now. The last scenario is for a toroid, and actually I've decided against including that in this video as well, because it'll help to go over solenoids first, which means we're pretty much done for this video. The last thing I'd like to do is compare the bios of Art law with Ampere's law. On some level, they're both very similar in the sense that we use them to calculate the magnetic field at a certain point due to electric currents in space, and both involve performing an integral. But there are certainly some differences between them as well. In the case of the bios of Art law, using it in practice is actually really difficult as we saw in the previous lesson. Don't worry, it's not just you. It really is difficult to make use of the bios of Art law because it involves such a complicated integral involving not a scalar, but a vector differential that's then crossed with another vector, and that's also not constant, so any solution process usually turns into a hairy mess. Comparatively, Ampere's law is very easy to use, provided you can set things up appropriately. Usually for each segment you're working with, B is either perpendicular to DL, in which case B dot DL is zero, or B is parallel to DL, in which case you can just multiply their magnitudes together. And in that second case, if b is constant, you can just pull b out of the integral altogether, which makes things even easier. So then if all that is the case, why would we ever want to use the bios of our law in the first place? Couldn't we just stick with Ampere's law from here on out? The thing is, the bios of our law is much more powerful. You can solve a lot more problems with the bios of our law than you can with Ampere's law. And actually, in theory, the bios of our law works for any possible continuous current distribution in space. For any set of currents, you can definitely, no questions asked, find an expression for the magnetic field at some point, at least in terms of an integral. But the same is not true with Ampere's law. In fact, in order to show the magnetic field vector you see on screen here, we had to use the bios of our law in our animation code. We had no other choice. Ampere's law only works in a few very specialized scenarios. But where it does work, it is an absolute beauty to use. Just like Gauss's law, right? Gauss's law works in very specific scenarios involving a lot of geometric symmetry, but where it does work, you want to use it for sure. You'd be crazy not to use it and calculate the electric field manually instead, or in the magnetic case, use the bios of Art law instead. But even in a scenario as simple as a closed current loop that even contains some obvious amount of symmetry, I've never seen any example of anyone using Ampere's law to find the magnitude of the magnetic field anywhere in space. How would you choose your Ampere loop? No matter what loop you choose, even if you were to choose a loop around one of these field lines, B changes magnitude a lot, so the integral of B dot DL is not going to give us anything easy to work with, which is a requirement for effectively using Ampere's law. We have no choice but to resort to the bios of Art law if we want the magnetic field in such scenarios, and we did actually use the bios of Art law twice, once to find the magnetic field at the dead center of the loop, and again to find the magnetic field on the axis of the loop. Finally, using Ampere's law requires that we know the direction of the magnetic field at all points on our Ampere loop. If we didn't, how on earth would we evaluate b dot dl? The bios of Art law makes no such requirements, as long as you know how the electric currents are oriented in space, in theory, that's all you need to be able to compute the magnetic field at any point in space. 